Good afternoon and welcome to our fifth Understanding Choices Forum. My name is Liz, uh, Liz Baumgart. I'm from the Eduardo Aboitis Development Studies Center and I'll be your MC for this afternoon. So once again, we welcome you to our Understanding Choices Forum. Are we ready for the new normal series? So this is actually our fifth or arguably also our sixth one because the last one was a back-to-back -back session, so it can be the 5.5 UCF forum. So for our first-timers here, um, welcome. For our, for our usual participants and guests to the UCF forum, we welcome you back. We hope we can stamp something <coughs> for you, for our frequent visitors. So um, to, to this afternoon's session was all about assessing risks manage, and managing climate change impact. So. Um, this is our again this is our fifth UCF and uh, for us it's it, we can never really stop talking about climate change and the things that are happening right now in our country and in this in our, in our world now so it's very important that we keep on talking about these things so so this afternoon we have a very uh, inspiring speaker and he will talk to us about what's about um, business risk assessment and the management and the management of climate change impacts here in our country uh, so without further ado uh, I would like to um, welcome our Executive Ar Director of the Eduardo Aboitis Development Studies Center, Ms. Evelyn Nacario Castro, to give her opening remarks and also to, um, to introduce our guest speaker for this afternoon. Thank you very much, Liz, and good afternoon. Uh, this is really an opportune time to gather once again uh, as we are nearing the anniversary of uh, Yolanda, and of course, uh, over in October, uh, the anniversary for uh, the earthquake <coughs> that hit Wohol. Allow me to share this line from the book of Genesis, and I quote, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The passage provides both the spiritual and historical context of mankind's rule over the earth. Over the years, we have successfully changed the landscape of our planet. The tremendous growth in our population, as well as the various physical and social infrastructures that we have built, suggests that the human race is way ahead in the quest for survival. Ironically, it is the very principle of survival that is now threatening our very existence. The observable destruction of our environment, including climate change-induced calamities and its devastating impact, has been attributed to human activities. They call this the anthropocentric uh, factor in uh, climate change. The privilege of ruling, therefore, comes with the responsibility of stewardship. After all, it is our survival that is at stake. We are now called upon to operate under the principle of the triple bottom line, looking at the economic, social, and environmental consequences of our actions. Groups and organizations, especially businesses, must endeavor to achieve not just profit, but economic prosperity, alongside social justice and environmental integrity. While the principle is gaining popular support, the immediate results of its adoption, however, cannot anymore prevent the effects and impacts of a changing climate. Beyond mitigating measures, we are therefore asked to prepare for and seriously consider adapting to these climate-related changes in terms of the new normal uh, way of living. It is in this premise that the Ramon Aboitis Foundation, incorporated through the Eduardo Aboitis Development Studies Center, organized a series of Understanding Choices Forum this year to increase the public's awareness on uh, disaster risk reduction and management, as well as climate change adaptation. This is also in response to the major calamities that beset us last year. Of course, the Bohol earthquake, as I mentioned, and Super Typhoon Yolanda. In fact, uh, in the newspapers, you will still note that there are still many areas, many communities, many families that have yet to uh, really recover from uh, the effects of those twin calamities. Though we initially planned to do a four-part event this year with the supposed last run, uh, tackling seismologic risk assessment with Dr. Solidum and the El Nino threat, 
uh, last July, we felt the need to further share information on climate change adaptation as an important subject and of course within the framework of DRM. <coughs> Frankly, we've been uh, really trying, even before uh, this year, we've really been trying to uh, uh, invite um, our resource person today, I think over the last two years, if uh, Monsi, if you remember that, we've been trying to <laughs> schedule getting him here to Cebu, but uh, he's been very busy. Um, of course, uh, traveling from one corner of the Philippines to another, and of course, surrounding uh, countries. So as a shared interest and goal, we have uh, invited the World Wildlife Fund to partner with us in today's Understanding Choices Forum. This afternoon, apart from presenting the results of the study which they have conducted, our resource person will jolt us into action. And uh, of course, his basis for that is uh, the results of the study which they conducted uh, with, uh, together with the BPI Foundation on business risk assessment and the management of climate change impacts, which, look, which looks at the level of vulnerability to environmental and climate exposure, socioeconomic sensitivity, and the adaptive capacity of Cebu and its environs. Uh, one of the 12 or 16 cities? We're now 16, right? Uh, Philippine cities that they have studied. Through this forum, we hope to contribute to better awareness and more understanding of the subject, as well as trigger plans and, importantly, action in relation to preparation and adaptation. And, of course, um, at the same time, really catalyzing reflection on an action towards the need to reducing activities and practices that are causing uh, or aggravating what's happening. Allow me at this stage to uh, introduce our very special uh, resource person. He is the Chief Executive Officer and Vice Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the WWF Philippines World Wildlife Fund. He concurrently ser serves as the Commissioner for Science and Technology of the UNESCO National Commission of the Philippines. He has made significant contributions in the national effort to promote climate change adaptation, the most re recent one being this uh, as lead proponent of the four-year assessment of business risks and opportunities arising from climate change study, covering, as I mentioned, 16 major Philippine cities. And of course, we know that if there are uh, calamities in areas where populations congregate, then those are the most vulnerable. His strong involvement in environmental conservation and sustainable development gained him membership in several organizations like the Sulawesi Marine Ecoregion uh, Tri-National Committee, the Protected Area Management Board of Tubataha Reef Natural Park, one of the places I want to go to, Glory. Me. Bring me there. Me. Okay. And the Joint Management Committee of the Turtle Islands Heritage Protected Area covering both Malaysia and the Philippines. He previously served as the founding chair and president of the Philippine Tropical Forest Conservation Foundation, a member of the first Philippine National Ecotourism Steering Committee, a member of the Interagency Task Force for Marine Mammal Conservation, and advisor to the National Disaster Coordinating Council. And this part, uh, the next uh, description of uh, Lori, I, I really, this is a surprise, but I'd like to uh, share it anyway. He does not actually only, um, you know, uh, converse with wildlife, but also with people as well and business. Because he's a, his undergraduate degree is actually psychology from Ateneo de Manila, so he understands very well um, uh, people, right? And a master's degree in business management from AIM. He's one person who moved from psychology and business to environment, wildlife, and. I, just as a contrast, Lori, I wanted to, uh, of course, this is of no interest, but I'm just curious because from my end, I was marine bio moving into working with people, right? <laughs> and uh, people at uh, different levels and different dimensions. So really a very good uh, combination of uh, academic preparation and, of course, his experience um, in terms of uh, work in environment. And now, of course, with uh, even more so uh, in the area of climate change. Uh, another interesting point is a body dive master, uh, wildlife photographer, and he shared with me earlier his plans, and I, I will not reveal them, you will have to reveal them yourself. 
and a producer of and a contributor to several books, audio and video documentary projects, especially in the environment. Two of his books, A Field Guide to Whales and Dolphins of the Philippines, Imagina, and The Last Great Forest won the National Book Awards for the Environment. And uh, we have a lot of students and uh, faculty from different universities in Cebu. You may want to take a look at this. He also His article, A Season for Whales, won as Travel Writer of the Year of the Philippine Kalakbay Award. His most recent book, uh, Managing Mindanao's Natural Capital, the Environment in Mindanao's Past, Present, and Future was published in 2012. Indeed, um, a person who has contributed a lot to uh, not only building knowledge on uh, the subject, but also really catalyzing action policies and programs for the country. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor and pleasure to finally have uh, Jose Maria Lorenzo, we call him Lori Ta. Thank you, Evelyn. Apologies to both for taking so long. Actually, I did in and out, I don't get a chance to speak here. Uh, it's not their fault, it's mine. Uh, I'll make a disclaimer before I start. Um, this is an abridged version. The normal presentation uh, covers 16 cities, and I will hold you here for two hours. Um, Monsi had advised me, and I think it was um, good advice, to focus on Cebu. So I said, allow me to expand it a bit to include two other Visayan cities, Lililo and Tagloban. So make one basis, no? So I'll focus on those three as far, and then on the broader big picture impacts. Okay. We live in the Anthropocene. This is a period in which human actions play a major role shaping the biosphere and its processes. Believe it or not, this photo is Palawan. The Great Acceleration was a period over the last 50, 60 years of my lifetime where we saw global economic activity accelerate through a range of <coughs> sectors through the roof. This is Cebu, 1944, 2014. Physical processes can no longer be examined in isolation because human processes have become the dominant driver. This is a statement made by the managing director of IMF last year. Read it. This is going to define what we are talking about today. Evelyn was talking about how we have to continue talking about this. No, we have to act. And we have to act at the very lowest denominator in our own homes. How do we act? I like to use the analogy of Pandora's box. <clears throat> she was given a box and said, don't open it, and she did. And so all these demons came out, bedeviling our existence. I like to compare the box to fossil fuels and the demons to climate change. We discovered petroleum 130 years ago, and it was God's gift to the world, or so we thought. It turns out to be the demons uh, that we let go. Now, there are two things we have to do. One, we have to shut the box. And that's what they call mitigation. Very often, when you hear press releases from the West, they talk about how we have to manage our carbon footprint. Why are they focusing on that? Dahil sila ang gumawa niya. It's their fault. A lot of the emissions we're suffering today, the impacts are come from there, from the US, from the EU, and so they're focusing on mitigation. Yes, we have to shut the box. But even if the Philippines is responsible for barely one third of one percent of global emissions, we are going to have to deal with the demons. And that's what they call adaptation, the management of risk. In 2009, WWF came out with a study <coughs> where we brought in 20 climate experts and 300 scientific journals, that's five years ago, journal articles, and they came up with six major scenarios that they believed would define climate change in our part of the world, the Coral Triangle, number one. El Nino is here to stay. 
it is going to be the diviner of variability. And I, that, I will keep on coming back to that word as I present. Earlier, Evelyn talked about how there was a Nino session here and the impacts of El Nino. I was in the Locos Norte just last week, and one of the people I know there is a man called Cardin Tolentino, who is the largest mango grower uh, up there. As you know, heat and mangoes like each other. And last year, when we heard that we were headed into El Nino, I had a chance to speak to Juan Cardin, and I told him, Juan Cardin, it looks like your wait of two years is going to pay off. We're headed into an El Nino. So he prepared, he prepared his trees, he had pruned, he sprayed, and sure enough, he had a bumper harvest. Unfortunately, the whole Philippines had a bumper harvest. So when I asked him, oh, how's that bang ganin yung? Sir, bakit? Bakit? Marami nga, pero pagsak ang presyo. What's the point of that story? <clears throat> there are both pros and cons. There are both bad and good things that come out of climate change. Okay? And that's because of variability. And that is the gift to us of El Nino. Sea surface temperatures. Four to six degrees. One to four degrees Celsius, sorry. Why is that a um, major factor? You know, generally the seas around the size are about 27, 28 Celsius. They hit 31 and the reef will bleach. What happens? The animals that give food and color to corals, so essentially, separate from their hosts because of the heat, and leaving behind white skeletons. No reefs, no fish. For an area like the Visayas, for whom fish is such an important part of your protein, that's a major impact. Acidification. Big word. What does that mean? In layman's terms, fish may not have bones, shrimp may not have skins, oysters may not have shells. Anything that needs calcium may not be able to develop. A change in pH is as crucial to the ocean's health as a change in pH is important to a farmer. Small change in pH, temper off. That's what acidification is all about. And virtually no one is talking about acidification. Sea levels. They're talking about millimeters, centimeters. They're talking about a century. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> how many meters above sea level is Mount Tan? How many meters above sea level was the seawall at Tacloban Stadium? And in 2010, in one summer, the sea levels in General Santos rose two meters in one week. So, there's something here which I will pass on to you about sea level rise. And this is really not just because of Antarctica or the Arctic, as the West would like us to think. It is really because of thermal expansion. What are you talking about? When you heat water, what does it do? It steams, but boils and then it steams. That's expansion. When you have expansion, you have moisture buildup. And moisture buildup fuels and accelerates the hydrological cycle, the water cycle. What's that? Mulan. Lumalakas ang ulan. So people say, why is it raining so much in Cebu? It's really because of heat. And this is aggravated by what they call <coughs> the urban heat island. Cebu is blanketed in cement. This is another factor. So you have all that heat from the Pacific Ocean, aggravated further by the urban heat island on Cebu City. You look at the Weather Philippines website or at Climatex or Project NOAA, and you look at the rainfall patterns on the Doppler radar, you will always see rain over Manila, Cebu, and Davao. Always. Tropical cyclones. Okay. That's not the future, no? That's the present. That's the past. We've had that. And we've had very strong storms. Finally, uh, flooding, rainfall, river flow. That also is not the future. We've seen that already. It's here. <clears throat> These impacts are going to be very locally specific. What will happen in Cebu is very different from what will happen to Manila, or what will happen in Baguio, or what will happen to, let's say, Butuan. 
they will also be nonlinear because of that variability. It's very difficult to find patterns, as you will see. This is the rainfall charts for the 16 cities we looked at. Look, see the differences? Ang laki. You look where Baguio is, the red line on top. Look where General Santos is, the line below. The differences in pattern, the differences in amount of rain are, are, are striking. The highest rainfall in Jensan is lowest than the lowest rainfall in Baguio. Okay? This is an example of how variable it will be and how specific and nonlinear it will be. Don't get bothered by that. Variability is par for the course. Look at the trends. You know, when people look at the stock market, uh, and they get scared, especially mga baguhan. And the stock market, don't get scared, look at the trend. It's still overall growth. It's the same thing. What is your trend? We've learned, you have to look at multi-year trends, like 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Then you see, rainfall is possible. You, you can see things like that. How about are the climate trends? First of all, heat. We're seeing this already. Over the last uh, 60 years, this normal curve has moved to the right. We've seen almost 30 years of increased heat with the hottest June in record this year. Higher temperatures are the norm. El Nino has become more frequent. The northern hemisphere is warmer in the south. We're seeing the intertropical convergence zone shifting away from the equator. And Arctic sea ice melt has accelerated to the point where current levels of summer ice are barely one half of what they were in uh, 1990. This has led to the enhancement of the rain cycle or the hydrological cycle. And the greatest change in precipitation has been, as well as the intense storms, which we have seen over the last five years. <clears throat> there has been a marked acceleration over the last five years. <coughs> Storm surge, record of all records was Takloban, where we broke the Dvorak scale and was a record of ocean acidification. This is a true shape of sea level rise. It does not raise like the water in that glass. No, it rises in peaks and valleys. If you look at sea level trends from the last 20 years, the highest area of sea level has, guess where? The Philippines. The satellite altimetry from NASA shows exactly the shape of sea level rise in 2010. These are images of the extreme weather events that we as a nation encountered over the last <coughs> five, six years, just in case you've forgotten some of them. I think what's very clear <coughs> is that no part of the country is spared. There's a song from the 60s entitled Nowhere to Run. And that's exactly it. Wherever you go, you're going to get hit. So we have to figure out how to live with it. <clears throat> Tacloban was not the first storm surge. And uh, Ayan or Yolanda was not the first 300 kph storm. And won't be the last. What's very clear is the economic and agricultural impacts of these things. And the question is, are we prepared? The trends indicate that it will get worse before it gets better. So if you're dreaming, oh, maybe that's the last storm, dream on. The forecasts for the 21st century, as generated by NASA, indicate that for heat, we will get more heat. And you know what heat does. For rain, we will get more rain globally. And therefore, you know what rain does. Those of you who live in greater Metro Cebu know what rainfall does to Cebu in one afternoon, right? So <clears throat> we're going to expect that. If all the ice melts, what will the Philippines look like? That's what the Philippines will look like. Look at Mindanao. This is Davao. This is Cebu. This is Luzon. Which city will take the place of Metro Manila? This is October this year, Metro Manila. Taft Avenue. <clears throat> so you asked. Is Cebu ready to take the place of Metro Manila? Beyond climate change, there are many things we have to look at. 
We're talking about, by the way, you're talking about 15 million people now. <laughs> Beyond climate change. <coughs> With the BPI Foundation, we embarked on a 16-city project. It started out as a four-city project, and it grew and grew and grew. Uh, looking at economic risks and opportunities arising from climate impacts. These are the 16 cities that we looked at. And basically, and I think this will be warm Evelyn's heart, one of the reasons we chose these cities was not only because of what many people know about them, was because they had data. We actually had to delist certain cities because they had no data. And if you just want to make an assessment based on subjective criteria, you might as well not waste your time and your money. <clears throat> One thing very clear is that urbanization is a clear trend. A city <coughs> operates like an FAD. You know, in fisheries, an FAD is a fisheries, a fish attraction device. It's a payao. And you put it in the water and it attracts the fish, it makes it fish easier for fishermen to catch. A city is like an FAD. It's like a payao and it draws people there. And I once asked a taxi driver why he came to Manila. He said, sir, he's from Tugigarao. I said, is it easier to live in Tugigarao? He goes, well, you know, I don't have to pay rent because my mother, I will live in her house and there's always food on the table, but, you know, sir, in Manila, And that's true for most cities. People come drawn by the lure of Yamashita's gold. And I asked him, but wala bang lotus sa inyo? <laughs> Di ba? Why do you have to come to Manila for that? Karina, we were talking. Um, you were saying that most of the taxi drivers in Manila appear to be from outside. They're not from Manila. No? I once had a taxi driver to look at the map to take me to where I wanted to go. Natakot ako nun. Kasi mukha mo wala. Cities are where risks converge, but it's also where opportunities converge. So what is the approach we used? The methodology. To get an idea of business risk, we did a multi-vector analysis looking at climate exposure, socioeconomic sensitivity, adaptive capacity, and development drivers, layer the, layering the data on top of each other, and trying to understand how is this going to lead on to a better understanding of the city. For socioeconomic sensitivity, these are some of the factors we looked at, many of them you're familiar with, things like tourism, Housing units, enrollment, agriculture, <laughs> trade, utilities. For adaptive capacity, <coughs> the ability of an area to bounce back, we looked at things such as your crime statistics, human development index, um, functional literacy, the revenues and savings of your LGU, the level of employment, family savings. And then we embarked on a scenario building exercise where we engaged business chambers, business clubs, NGOs, academe from the city, together with the public sector to look 20 years into the future. What would be the development drivers that would dominate a city in a climate-defined future? And taking these four layers together, we were able then to understand what the business risks and opportunities were for the city. Now let's look at the three cities that I promised I'd show you in the Visayas. First, let's start with Iloilo. Look at population density. It has a density of 5,400 per square kilometer, which is only slightly lower than Baguio's 5,006. It's built on reclaimed land and is therefore naturally flood prone. It is also within the typhoon belt. Clearly, flooding is going to be in Iloilo's future. Real estate, finance, insurance, and business services have emerged. As the areas of new investment, traditional businesses like shipping, fisheries, and rice have remained stagnant for 20 years. And therefore, Iloilo has to leverage its five airports on an island-wide plan, watershed management, flood management, and this is the city's opportunity. The residents identified education and poverty as their main development drivers. It's the only city where it came out, and we were wondering why, and it turned out it had the lowest functional literacy of the cities in phase one, the highest crime rate, and the lowest crime to this resolution efficiency. Many years ago, Nicholas Loney went to Iloilo and reinvented that city. Maybe it is time for reinvention again. Will it be in call centers? Well, maybe not. They're kind of low on the ladder. Will it be in tourism? This is what Boraca is going to look like. Will it be in education? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> if all the ice melts, this is what Panay Island will look like. Is the future of Iloilo in export? Maybe not. Maybe the future of Iloilo is really closer to home. Uh, last week I was there, met, um, uh, before that I met with Mayor Bobilo, and they're obviously doing some wonderful things in Iloilo City. Later. This assessment was done in September of 2013, two months before Yolanda. Population density of only 1,000 per square kilometer. Remember, Iliulia had 5,400 per square kilometer. Very high climate exposure. In fact, the highest for that uh, phase, phase three. Governance and in the economic sector were identified as its major drivers. Aside from the fact that Tacloban is a regional hub, there were both positives and negatives of socioeconomic sensitivity and an adaptive capacity. <laughs> Uh, a little more negatives than in other cities. This is the way Tacloban looked in 1944. It looks the same in terms to a climate lens today. Uh, we recommended upgrading of the city's water supply and drainage system. We recommended zoning and land use work because of all the uh, informal settlers. We asked them to consider the uplands. And in a worst case scenario, this is what Leyte and Samar would look like. We asked them to build away from the coastline. I said Tacloban is a city in flux. And we said, it's time to think where you want to go and how you're going to get there because <coughs> things need to be tweaked. And then you land a hit. Anyway, we're meeting our first year anniversary and I hope we've learned some lessons. Let's move to Cebu. Only 2,600 people per square kilometer versus Tacloban's 5,4, ah, 1,000, and Iloilo's 5,4. Strength of Cebu is its strategic location. Trade defines Cebu. It's a processing center, a trade center, a manufacturing center, and therefore it needs extremely reliable infra, efficient land and sea access, cost competitive utilities, particularly water. And those were identified in the scenario building exercises here where water resource management was But the whole water system of Cebu is anchored on groundwater extraction. It is groundwater dependent. Today, if you dig a well in Maxilom or Mango Avenue in the old days, you will get salt water. What is the effect of that? Let me take you to Hagunoy Bulacan, a town that has been traditionally dependent on groundwater for the last 25 years. This is Hagunoy. You notice there is no rain, there is no storm, there is no wind. This is a sunny day. This happens every day. Hagunoy has sank almost two meters below sea level. And Hagunoy, you see, you can't tell the difference between the river and the road. This is what happens due to excessive groundwater extraction, and this is irreversible. In Cebu City alone, there are 17,000 wells. How does Cebu maintain its reliability? As weather events become more extreme, there may be impacts on supply chain and on workforce dislocation within Cebu. So it has to figure out how to sustain its leadership in many areas, tourism, foreign trade, reserves, back deposit values. One big thing is land use. Under the law, only lands with a slope of 18% or less can be classified as A and D. 28% of Cebu falls within this range. However, 64% of the city's land are classified as A and D. This must be resolved. Because if you have no water, you have no work. The building and development in Cebu has been from the shore up to the hills. We have to figure out how to diffuse risk and move the development along areas where water is upward and downward along the coastline rather than up into the hills. This is not Hong Kong. This is Cebu. We have to look at transport infrastructure as well. Are all your eggs in one basket? Look at Panay. Panay has five airports and a backup on Bacolod. How many does Cebu have? None. It's in Bactan. 
This is a flood simulation on Mactan to sea level rise. And you want to build another airport there? <clears throat> you have options elsewhere. Our Cebu seaports, climate smart. 90% of Philippine cargo is carried by ship. This is a study made by Stanford University on how we can prepare seaports for climate change. But this is only one view. This is a Western view. The Singaporeans have a better idea. They have figured out that cement floats. They have developed floating container ports. This is not a design or a dream or an artist's concept. You go to Marina in Singapore, you will see it. It's there. It's what they call VLFS technology. Let the seas rise, so will our container terminals. The Cebu have all-weather urban corridors. These photographs from your own local media provide an answer. This is a simulation of the exposure of Cebu in the event of sea level rise in a worst case scenario. You want to buy a beach house? Cebu City's opportunity is to invest now in a broader, more sustainable multi-city plan that diversifies water supply sources, upgrades land, sea, and air infrastructure. Will a second Mactan airstrip provide sufficient redundancy to guarantee Cebu's viability in a climate-defined future? The object is to manage water, and access for Cebu will be key maintaining viability and competitiveness. Very few people have looked at seaports. Cebu should be the first. Should be the first. Something from Charles Darwin. We are science-based, so let's go back to this plan. Um, he said the key is to be responsive to change. Not the strongest, not the most intelligent, not the richest, but the one most responsive to change. So what are the patterns and opportunities we saw as we went through the 16 cities? Number one, we have to make it very clear that the Philippines means business. <coughs> Cebu has to make it very clear that Cebu means business. I once asked the chairman of the Chinese Chamber of Seafood Merchants in Hong Kong, what's the best lapu-lapu in the world? And he said, Philippines. And I said, where? He said, Palawan. Who is your number one supplier? He said, Darwin, Australia. I said, why? He goes, you know, I apply online. They respond online. I send my PO online. They give me the invoice online. I pay online. They tell me when to send it online. I send my ship and everything I order is there. Nothing more, nothing less, on time. And I get to leave, no problem. Here, I don't even know to talk to. We have to make it very clear that if, if, if our country means business, then we have to figure out how we can improve the way we deal with other countries and ourselves uh, with each other. Otherwise, then uh, we're just kidding each other, no? We have to be more proactive about this. I've seen, we've all seen how, you know, Filipinos, Somebody said, what the hell? It's natural, no? But we have to be more proactive. I've always said disasters are man-made. They're man-made. The women are not one responsible, men only. <laughs> Gender fair. <laughs> uh, uh, and so we have to be proactive about this. Because if you want to talk about resilience, urban resilience, business resilience, competitiveness, you have to be able to anticipate what could happen, what's the management of risk. For example, the other day I posted on Facebook, yes, I'm on Facebook. Um, um, what will happen, do you have a plan? What will happen when the 7.5 earthquake hits Manila? What will happen to you? What will you do if you're at work? What will you do if you're at home? What will you do if you're out of town? Think about it. If you're at work, what will you go home? How will you go home? What if the streets are still zero? What if the bridge collapsed and you live in the north and the, your office is in the south? 
You go to work home. You can call your wife. You can call your kids. What will you do? You have to talk about it. Not just think about it. Diba? You have a plan. Proactive. And let's say you're at home. <laughs> you're all at home. It's a Sunday. Will you stay home? Will you go out? Why will you go out? Diba? Uh, where will you go? To the province? Why you won't reach? The, <laughs> you can't get out of, of Manila. So what do you do? What if you are in Hong Kong in a conference or on a vacation in Korea or, or are you going to come home or will you stay there? If you come home, baka maipit ka sa Terminal 3, di ko malabas. Diba? You'll be like that person who lived there for 60 days. Diba? So you have to talk about these things. That's what they talk about being proactive. Another example, Guam. You know, Guam, uh, FDR sent me to Guam a few years ago. And I learned a lot about climate preparedness from them. You know, Guam has 300 kph typhoons. They also have intensity 8 earthquakes. And they have not lost a single house in 50 years to earthquakes or typhoons. Not a single one. And I said, what did you do? They said, it's so simple. We have rules, we implement the rules. You don't implement, we, we stop you from occupying your house. Why? They don't have GI rules. Their rules are reinforced concrete. It gets hot. They put foam inside the concrete, so it's not hot anymore. It's like a cooler. No? They have windows. Ang windows nila, kailangan may storm shutters. Pag may darating na bagyo, everybody has to have a storm shutter. If you build a house, you don't have a storm shutter, you will not be given an occupancy permit. They have rules. When a typhoon is coming, kasi magaling ang pag asa nila. They have rules. 72 hours, these are the rules. 48 hours, there are the rules. Da? Against the weather, 24 hours, they have the rules. And in 20, 24 hours before the storm, you are not allowed on the street. You go out on the street, they'll throw you in jail. You spend typhoon in jail. <laughs> diba? So, and they have done it. We have problems with collapsing Meralco poles. What they did is in areas na crucial, let's say, uh, yung kusap pumuputay yung refugees government centers, hospitals, they put the lines underground in the areas that are not so crucial. They double the size of the posts. Mahal, I know, basically saying, mahal yung ganyan. Bit by bit, bit by bit. You know, you put aside, it's like a uh, heavy avenue project, but you, if you cannot do it in one shot, you do it in phases. But look at Guam today. They're able to withstand it. And you know where they learned all of that? From the Philippines. <laughs> from Subic Bay go to Subic Bay you'll see the poles are built that way the houses have reinforced concrete roofs that was built 50 years ago see proactive <laughs> site specific so you cannot simply do what somebody else does the Cebuanos will have your own solution because there's a social element here no? You are friends, you are compadre, you are business associates. There's a different thing. So each place will have its own way of doing things. Some of you helped Bohol. Some of you helped Tacloban as well, Leyte. And there's a big difference between the way Bohol and Leyte has big difference. So there's not a cut and paste. It's something you have to do different. That means you have to have local people interested. People of Cebu, Mandawe, Liloan, Talisay. They have to be involved. It cannot be somebody from outside say, this is what we did in the Netherlands. No. No. Because it may not work. Like for example, they want to build this dike around Laguna de Bay. When you say, I want to build a dike around Laguna de Bay, what do you expect the shape? Round, diba? Around it. Around Laguna de Bay. No! If you look at the plans, the shape is letter C. That means half of the shore, walang protection. Half of the shore, meron. So what will happen to the other half pag malakas ang maha? Doon pupunta yung maha. I told them, alam po ninyo, yun ang ginawa nila sa Liguazan Marsh noong 1970s, 80s. Ginawa nila, nilagyan nila ng dike ang lahat ng bayang kristyano at yung mga bayang muslim ay walang dike. So every year, pag bumababa ang tubig, galing sa bukit noon at pupunta sa Liguazan, yung mga bayang muslim ay four months nasa baha. Kung four months of the year nasa baha ka, hindi ka magagalit. 
she may mag, mag uh, saka. No? That's what happened. And that's what will happen in Laguna de Bay. Mga galit yung mga mayor, sir. Uy, uy, kung gagawa kayo ng dike, bakit hindi dito? There's another thing about dikes, which we learned from <coughs> Mayor Babilog's people in, in Iloilo. DPWH, when they say, okay, we will fix the highway, make it all weather, they like to make embankments. What are embankments? Tinataas yung lupa. So, mataas yung lupa. Mali yun eh. Ba't din ang ginagawa yun? Pura kasi. Masyadong mahal daw ang style kandaba, biotact. Should you, should we, taxpayers, be made to pay the cost of business dislocation because the government wants to save money on a road? No. They should make a road that serves the people. Secretary De La Cruz, a grand reform, two weeks ago at the GK summit said, you know, if the specification for a national highway is 12 inches of concrete, the specification for a secondary road should be 24. I said, why? Who gets more attraction for budget? The national highway, more voters. Secondary road, you get one, maybe 10 years before they'll pay attention to you again. And whenever you do a diversion, traffic, detour, or the where did the buses and trucks travel? Secondary road. Kaya nasisira. So he says, if you do it that way, you have to spend more money on the secondary road rather than on the primary. Because the primary will always get fixed. But the secondary ones in a while now. Um, not cut and paste. Might work somewhere, embankments won't work. That's not fair. Let's go back to Laguna de Bay. This is the wall. Does rain choose which side of the wall it will fall on? No. No, it will drain this way, into the lake. So rain falls on both sides. Okay, yung ulan dito. Eh, yung ulan dito, matatrap ng wall. Saan siya pupunta? Talagay mo ng drain na ganyan? Eh, dati, libre yan eh. So, I think we need engineers who can think a little more innovatively rather than business as usual. Hindi, yung bank pen, kasi yun lang budget namin eh. Pwede yung ganun. Hindi na pwede yung ganun. Population and consumption will be major drivers of development in the climate future. We live in Asia. See that circle? That's the Asia Pacific. There are more people living inside that circle than in the whole rest of the world. That's where we are. This is the Philippine population in 2010, and look what it will be like in 2050. And this is Cebu. Cebu City, not Cebu Province. Cebu City. That's what, 500,000 more people who have to go to school, who have to eat, who have to get jobs. Think about it. We found that good weather and a lot of land creates what we call a migratory sink. Davao is a migratory sink. Their population has doubled in 20 years. Sabuanga. Surprisingly, it's a migratory sink. Maybe people from moving away from, from violence and conflict. Also, people who are moving across the border from Indonesia and Malaysia to come in for opportunity. Believe it or not, there are other people who believe that the Philippines is the land of opportunity. Even if Filipinos are going abroad, there are other people who are coming here naman. <coughs> in one city in General Santos, there are 85,000 people out of a total official population of half a million. And they're saying, that be right. How can there be 85,000 people in one city? Wala, ang daming mga uh, unrecorded, undocumented uh, uh, migrants from Indonesia who live, live there. So, there is still, our country is still attractive to some. They come, they come. But then, migratory sinks. And you see, this, this fuels urbanization, you believe it ko kanina. Give an idea. If you look at this chart, shows you, if you just look at land area, the biggest one, this is the first 12 cities, no, is Davao. Look at Iloilo, it's number 9. And look at Baguio, it's number 11. In terms of land area. Let's look at population. Oh, Davao is still number 1. But Iloilo has gone up from number 9 to number 5, and Baguio has gone up from number 11 to number 7. Okay? Let's look at population density. Who is number 1? Baguio. Number 2 is Iloilo. They were at the bottom, Kanina. 
What does this point to? The cities that have bigger land area seem to be still within manageable levels in terms of density. But the cities that were set up small, 70 square kilometers, 50 square kilometers, are having serious problems. And these are the cities that are going to have to face the same challenge as Metro Manila. They're struggling now with how do you manage Metro Manila? Could we create an authority, again, a governor? I said, please, please, let's not go back to martial law, okay? <laughs> but um, we're struggling with that. But cities that are set up a small size are going to have to struggle with the same problem. Probably Cebu and the areas around, Mandawe, Lilohan, Tilasa, Talisay. You have to learn how to work together. The mayors in Manila don't. Everybody has their own decision. They don't. Don't copy Metro Manila, whatever you do. I was so happy to hear it called Mega Cebu and not Metro Cebu because Iba naman sa Metro Manila. This is a major problem. Look at this satellite image. You can see. What is the pattern? No pattern. And that's what we're seeing. No pattern. You do what you like to do. No? 